Welcome to Thrive at Work, a podcast which offers insights and latest employment trends to help employers attract, retain and develop great people with me, Polly Rathbone-Ward. With special guests, we're going to be discussing the many and varied aspects of HR, from practical topics to overarching cultural themes. We'll be looking beyond traditional styles of management to bring new and people-centred ideas to forward-thinking organisations that want to shape a new future where people can thrive at work. Hello and welcome to Thrive at Work. Today, I'm really pleased to introduce my guest, Ian Dinwiddie, founder of Inspiring Dads, helping businesses enhance their offer for dads. We're going to be discussing how employers can support men to be great fathers without sacrificing a great career, and how normalising flexible working can have a positive impact in many areas. I will let Ian introduce himself in a moment, but I was particularly keen to speak to Ian because I find that initiatives around gender equality in the workplace are often aimed towards women and Ian's focus is on men. So Ian, thank you for joining me today and welcome. Thank you very much for having me, Polly. It's great to be here. Um, Yeah, as you said, um, I founded Inspiring Dads. It's a coaching company um, focused on supporting dads, supporting dads through the transition primarily between, uh, between before when they become a father ultimately, and so really looking to balance sort of, sort of the work and family pressures and understanding what kind of things they can do to improve their own well-being, still to perform at work and to be a great partner, still have time for themselves. So helping men to balance that transition because I think it is particularly challenging. And I started off thinking about how I could support individual dads and that's morphed into uh, much more focus in terms of looking after um, dads within businesses themselves so that's where that's where I am at the moment. Great so tell me a little bit about your background and how you've come to to found this business. Yeah, so I've got two children and my daughter's 11 and my son is eight. And when Freya was born in 2010, my wife Lisa and I had already had some really important conversations about how we were going to manage being parents. And I actually handed in my notice at my previous business consultancy company called Change Management Group uh, about nine months before I was due to leave. Because um, we'd already planned out this kind of structure of what we were going to do and how we were going to do it. And ultimately, what we realised as a couple was that with two jobs that were quite demanding in terms of location and hours my wife's a lawyer uh, she was working long hours in London we live in southeast London and back when long hours for lawyers meant being in the office uh, sort of permanently pretty much permanently during the week and I was working as a management consultant and I was working frequently away from home and without any sort of family support around us we don't have any grandparents living locally we knew we had to do something that would Um, would make sense for our kind of family unit someone had to be there to sort of look after our children you know we quite quickly sort of dismissed the idea for us it wouldn't work sort of having a nanny or anything like that and so we came to the conclusion that uh, initially I actually worked four days a week I, I, I moved from five days to four days a week for when up until Freya was about six months old and then I stopped work altogether. Lisa and I had a a month of handover and transition and then I became a full-time stay-at-home dad uh, when Freya was six months and then for about nine months I did that on a full-time basis and then she went to nursery two days a week, a Thursday and a Friday and I managed to get some freelance work immediately on a Thursday and a Friday basis and so I was back into that corporate side of things. I mean, I did that twice. I did that with our son, Struan, as well, where I took, uh, I took time off and I became the primary carer after Lisa had completed her six months of maternity leave. And that was sort of the, and that at the time wasn't necessarily, I didn't have any great vision about a business that was around supporting dads. That came much later. It was sort of a transition, really, Polly. I, um, I was trying to work out what I could do on a more long term basis that would fit around the challenges of pickups, especially around school. We were quite aware, I think, maybe more aware. I was more aware than perhaps a lot of men are that actually school hours are very, very different from nursery. And that nine till three is an absolute killer for if you've got used to seven till six nursery drop off times. Um, It's an entirely different dynamic. So I needed to find something that would work on a long term basis. 
And Lisa was at uh, Linklater's, a law firm at the time, and she was on a women's leadership development course, and she was receiving coaching. And she said, this, this coaching that we're, what we're going through, this process around coaching seems a lot like the type of work you really enjoyed as a management consultant, kind of helping people to understand what their strengths were, what the, um, what the process was, how to be successful in whatever they were sort of targeting. And maybe there's something in it for, for you to look at. And I was like, well, actually, I know a coach. And so I spoke to her and we, we had coffee together, Petra. And, um, and then I was like, well, actually, this does fit really nicely. And so I, I went and did a qualification for coaching. And I realized that as I was working with uh, men and women and just, just learning the kind of coaching skills, was that I felt there was a particular demographic that resonated with me which was around men and the transition through fatherhood and trying to balance these different aspects of, of modern life. And perhaps, whereas a generation ago, men were, uh, you know, the role of a father was quite simple. You know, you went out to work, you provided. That's pretty much where it began and ended in some ways. Um, and it wasn't that there weren't men who were really great at doing that, and, but it was quite simple. And I realised that men were struggling, and particularly I became a became apparent they were struggling around becoming a dad for the first time and that emotional and uh, that emotional and practical upheaval and how to navigate it so I think if you get things right then it's great for well-being but also it's great for gender equality and I became aware that as a uh, as a kind of supportive partner to to a woman who was progressing her career actually I could see firsthand some of the gender equality challenges and how perhaps we needed to reframe the conversation around fatherhood in order to unlock the potential for everyone to make really great choices I think Polly great choice for men to have the choice to be um, to be more actively involved in their in their children's upbringing in a way that maybe their parents or dads weren't and for women to fulfill their potential in the workplace. Thank you absolutely um, just before we move on what were your experiences of being um, a stay-at-home dad for a while in terms of some of the practicalities I think it's I think it's interesting I think it's, I've, I met a lot of dads who really struggled the emotional side of being a stay-at-home dad and their identity especially as a man within what is a, a female dominated environment that never it was never a challenge for me I was very um, very relaxed a lot of female friends very relaxed around women generally I'd worked in female dominated environments it just didn't really worry me but I knew a lot of dads I went to dads only kind of social groups um, and what I found was that there were a lot of dads who that was their sole interaction with um, with uh, you know with other parents was with other dads and it, it, it was I felt a little bit sad that this, this was a struggle I could see why it might might come about and um, and why they might be uncomfortable so from the emotional point of view not so much practically I mean I guess this is the main thing is that you learn skills as a dad looking after young children that you may not necessarily get to do and you get to do it on your own I think it's one of the most powerful aspects around any kind of extended leave for dads is that whether it's shared parental leave or extended paternity leave it's that dads learn the skills and they learn to make the mistakes that makes them great at parenting. And they learn things that traditionally has been, um, dare I say, it's kind of part of the myth, not the myth exactly, that's the wrong word. It's part of the identity of motherhood. And actually, when we, when we see parenting as a motherhood thing, it's quite damaging for the prospects generally. I think of women and also the prospects of men who want to step back and to be more actively involved and maybe work more flexibly uh, and that side of things. So you, I learned, I learned to make sure the nappy bag was packed properly. I learned, I learned that nappy changing facilities are usually in women's toilets unless it's modern facilities. And I learned that I didn't care. And I, and I became a very big advocate for um, pushing back on any suggestion that I was somehow giving mum a break. So I tried to be nice about it. And I'm sure at some stage I was a little bit cutting when, when well-meaning people said, oh, it's nice that you're looking after your children. It's like, well, no, they're my children. You know, we need to move away from this. And today is my opportunity to educate you on that. So hopefully I did it in a nice way. And apologies to any little old ladies who I may have offended with being slightly uh, uh, slightly dismissive of their 1950s stereotypes that they were that they were quite that they were happy to to introduce me to. So I apologize in advance in retrospect to those ladies in particular. 
a lot of people, you know, a lot of men actually want to do more, you know, um, and for some reason they, they don't or they can't or just the practical things put them off, such as the, the nappy changing facilities in the female toilets. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm not sure, not sure it's so much the practical element of it. I think we things are changing relatively quickly, and certainly um, COVID has accelerated a desire for men to men, and we're talking dads in particular. I guess eighty percent of men become a father at some stage during their lives. I think it's the kind of global stat, but more about that that sort of emotional and societal expectation around what a good dad looks like, and that breadwinning responsibility. And in a lot of heterosexual relationships, men do earn more. It's becoming less obvious and it's becoming more nuanced. And certainly in our relationship, Lisa and I, Lisa earned more than I did when we met and that never changed and has never changed. Um, and Inspiring Dads would have to be an amazingly successful business for me to, to compete uh, on any level these days. Um, but I think men fear that as a man, there are responsibilities to provide, first and foremost, and that is a, that's kind of how we've seen the role of dads, probably since the Industrial Revolution in some ways, and that binary nature of women staying at home and caring, whether that's children or whether it's older, older parents and just caring generally, and the man provides. And when you take it, when you have it, when dads only have two weeks, potentially only two weeks of statutory leave, and mums might have six months or could, have to, could take a year off and the dad already earns more. There's a very real sense around men redoubling their efforts to provide. Mm -hmm. And anything that's seen as a going against that is in some ways a challenge, both on an individual level and societal level, because we don't expect men to want to do it. And we, and within the workplace, I think there are challenges around the assumptions about what men and women can do and what leave they're going to take and whether they're going to have children knock-on implications in terms of recruitment and then we do and, and for men to do something different outside of the norm is quite challenging on an individual basis but also there's a fear of being seen as uncommitted and if I'm not seen as uncommitted if I don't want to work the hours that my male boss which is often how it works my male boss the male leadership role models in the business are working then what does that say about me it says I'm less of a man less I'm not following what we expect of a man and the danger is I don't I don't get the promotion and that has a knock-on impact on my family's um, you know financial opportunities and men fear that implication when you take away that fear of being seen as uncommitted you know um, evidence suggests um, that men are equally as likely to take the opportunity to work flexibly um, Zurich and the Government Behavioural Insights team did a year-long survey before the pandemic and what they did, Zurich changed how they advertised their jobs. I think they I think it was seven words they put in and it, it was along the lines that this job is full, open to fully flexible working or words to that effect. And what they found was a lot of there was a lot of news reporting around how important it was for mums, which yes it is, but buried away in the data, they found that it was equally as important for men. That was the outcome. Men were equally as likely to apply for these jobs as women were, suggesting there's an entire, when you take away the fear of asking for flexible working, I mean, it kind of feels a little bit, a little bit like that horse has bolted in terms of COVID, but take away that fear, then men will, when men will do it, they don't want to ask for it, but if it's implicitly flexible and that builds in, you know, they can build in more connections maybe with their family and to do things differently, they will take that opportunity. It's just that sometimes the barriers that are put up in terms of what we expect and the assumptions around what we expect that men will do, do get in the way, I think. Interesting, thank you. <clears throat> so um, around inspiring dads, um, you mentioned coaching earlier. So are your clients mainly organisations or individuals or how does that work? What, what services do you offer? Yeah, so I, I started off, Polly, um, really wanting to focus on the business consumer side of things. But what I found was that men, men, and it's kind of perhaps classic kind of stereotype, men knew there was an issue potentially. They knew they were under pressure. They knew they weren't happy and content but moving them through that sort of buyer's journey effectively to actually wanting to work with someone and putting and, and doing something for themselves was tricky to do. I got quite a lot of referrals through female partners of men who were, they were concerned and almost the permission to spend time talking about themselves. Um, but it just wasn't, 
just wasn't getting traction. And then I felt that actually there are there are organisations who support dads. There are um, there are a growing number of large 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 corporate organisations who see the benefits of equalising parental leave. And so they will, and regardless of how you become a parent, what gender you are, you take the same amount of leave, and it's built into their culture, and they're starting to move. And then when you get men who are going away for three months from the office. They are then returning to the office in the same way with the same with the same broad challenges. They are quite different, actually, in terms of returning from maternity leave and returning from extended parental leave, paternity leave for men. When men return, they the things they're worried about are actually very different to the challenges that women want to talk about um, in terms of coaching. But there's a whole group of men, an increasing number of men who actually need some help processing and being the best they can be so they can be great you know they can be great at work and they can be great at home and they can work out where those pressure points are and so I work with um, I work with organizations either you know companies either directly or often through third party so I work as an associate coach for a number of coaching businesses where actually there's not a lot of it around yet for dad dad coaching there's not enough there's not that much demand yet but it is growing and so there's a you know there's enormous um, growth market as innovative businesses start to see actually if we focus our gender uh, equality strategy just on women then actually we 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 go we only go so far and by understanding what men um, you know what men men's challenges are what their fears are and how supporting men is a route to gender equality we can pull some of those levers. And you know, part of that is coaching. And sometimes that's group coaching. And um, we've got a product called the New Dads Accelerator, which gets men together virtually. We go through some court, we do some course content, and then each week we discuss what's going on. And we, we, we create a pop-up community of dads who are online to discuss how they feel about their relationships, how they feel about the pressures, and, in a, and create this kind of safe space that dads don't necessarily have because we assume that men don't want to talk about that stuff, but actually, if you create the right environment, they absolutely will do so. And so you can use that in, in concert with one-to-one -one coaching as well. So it's um, it's a powerful way of improving well-being and unlocking gender equality. Brilliant, absolutely. So when you're talking about um, equal policies in terms of parental um, policies for for men and women, um, have you how how have you seen that much in workplaces? That I mean, I you know fully support that but I can't imagine that's very popular right now or very common <laughs> it's it's not massively common and I think this is one of the challenges in in the UK is we have a we have a, almost a three-tier system at the one end you've got um companies like I mean there is actually uh, there is actually a list which I'm hoping to read there's something called the shared parental league which I um a guy called Joe Young who I've been talking to about reinvigorating it he went on shared parental leave and he started to um, research wh what businesses were great for dads in terms of what leave they gave. So, you know, the classic one that gets described in this country we talk about is Aviva being probably the first of the businesses who equalised parental leave. So they did away with secondary, secondary carers, primary carers, regardless of how you became a parent, you were entitled to six months. And what they find, the stats are something like, uh, I haven't got the media to hand, it's something like 85% of men who were eligible took the took the full six months of leave and they've embedded that in their culture and there are around when when joe did the mo most recent update of the shared parental league had about 50 companies who were enhancing leave now a number of them were equalizing but no, it's relatively small so you've got these companies doing six months that dads can take six months at full pay at the other end of the spectrum you've got you've got self-employed um who don't have any any rights to any leave maternity or paternity there's nothing on the statute book from government at all and it's just absurd and um, there's a uh uh olga fitzroy and she runs the um the campaign for um equalizing parental leave and i can't remember exactly what it's called but we can we can look it up later and put it in the uh, put it in the comments and put it in the in the in the bio, um, and so she, her campaign is all about supporting freelancers because you've got this you've got this three tier system you've got men potentially taking two weeks of statutory in the middle, you've got men and women who have no leave at all, 
um, if they're freelancers. And you've got these amazing corporate policies um, driven by the likes of Aviva, Deloitte, Invest Tech in particular spring to mind, a lot of the law firms as well, where they're moving towards actually, if we take away that sense that men don't take leave, women do, we we pull some really important levers around gender equality in the workplace. And, you know, there are businesses certainly who are moving in that direction and enhancing their leave because they realise that, you know, you don't get gender equality if you assume that men don't take leave and women do. Indeed, absolutely. I'm fascinated by that. So when you said that, you know, the really high percentage of men who had the opportunity to take a large amount of leave did, um, which is amazing, how do you think those sorts of businesses have embedded that sort of um, normalised that in a way in their culture? How do you think they've done that? Because there'll be some businesses out there that have all these amazing busy policies, but people probably don't take them up because of some stigma attached or because of a fear of how that's going to be, um, how they think they're going to be reflected on. Or how, how do you think those businesses have actually got and managed to embed that within their culture? Yeah, I think they part of what they do is they tell great stories they they normalize it by by almost almost eulogizing men who do it and this is one of these kind of perverse kind of um sort of fatherhood um perks almost is that the bar is set pretty low for men and fatherhood in many ways a hands-on fatherhood not fatherhood per se and but definitions of hands-on fatherhood because i think you know lots of men will say they're great fathers but they won't have any um they won't have any idea of uh, where the doctor's surgery are they've never taken their child to us you know to an optician's appointment it's john adams who's um dad blog uk was talking about this recently and um, something i saw uh, and he was like what's the definition of a hands-on dad and part of it was have you taken your child to an optician's appointment do you know do you know the name of the doctor where they go for the doctor's surgery this kind of which is a really interesting way and i think it's, it's really fascinating so the definition of being a good, good dad kind of is is sort of tricky to unpick but they tell great stories so yeah they put they almost put men on a pedestal who are taking leave and then they normalize it and they work i think they probably work quite closely with line managers because for most individuals the experience the on the ground experience of what you're going to do and you know and how you're going to operate as a dad what how you're going to organize your work comes down to whether your line manager is supportive and if you don't have that level bought in then you know culture you know a desire at the bottom meets a policy at the top and it gets squeezed around line management it was exactly the same when we when we work as a management consultant we would squeeze we'd squeeze the line management um, I did a lot of operational change within food factories and we would work quite heavily on empowering the lowest level of the workforce to understand what a great day looked like and it was, it was food production so it was just make, making stuff and making sure machines ran and we got the right outputs when they knew and the bosses knew you could squeeze the managers in the middle who was actually which is actually where the behavioral change needs to be embedded but yeah they tell great stories they they almost put men on a pedestal in order to make it okay for other men to do it yeah and that, uh, I, I was right i've just i just had a quick little look the um the deloitte in 2020 uh 99% of new dads uh at Aviva took parental leave and 84% of them took at least six months um so they they really have kind of embedded it within the culture but sometimes it's more than just uh, that kind of the culture around leave it's the culture that surrounds it I heard something really fascinating from a, about a bank who almost pretty much enforced their men taking their six months of leave it was i think it was goldman sachs was the story now I, it, it's second hand so i'm a little bit careful about um telling goldman sachs for this but goldman sachs have six months of uh, parental leave uh, if men can take it men do take it they're all they're forced to take it but when they come back there's no sense that anything's changed they almost lift that individual out of the business and then drop them back in and, they, and then but the working culture around the hours and the expectations don't change um, somewhere else, uh, someone I, I know who I used to coach talked about how they were eulogizing. There was a partner in his business who was eulogizing um, how amazing the mental health support was when he had a breakdown. 
which perhaps is the wrong way of looking at it. So I think there's, I think certainly companies sometimes struggle with actually looking after mental health is quite sexy. Uh, that's definitely the wrong way of looking at it but it's it, it, it's an interesting you know it, it's important to do but actually what are we doing um, you know on a proactive basis and actually helping men to get their work-life balance right so they're comfortable and they're happy is actually heads off a lot of these challenges and maybe you know there's elements around human-sized jobs as well that we need to consider but if you can get if you can normalize that conversation we talk about leaving loudly um some research from uh, Dr. Jasmine Kellen at University of Plymouth, and uh, she she found uh, this collaboration piece. Um, and what they found was that men in the UK were more likely to say that they were sick themselves than to say that they were looking after a sick child. Oh, yeah. This was kind of some of their research sort of pre-pandemic, and um, that was one of the, you know that's one of the challenges. We hide away men um, men hide away parental responsibility because they don't feel like it's okay to do men kind of understand the motherhood penalty there's a father tuc in 2017 found that it was actually a fatherhood bonus though they, they estimated that uh men with children earned on average about 20 percent more than men without children at the same part of their career path wow that's interesting and some of yeah some of that will be to do with this idea that men with because they have more responsibilities and they're now they've got a, a family to provide for they're more likely to get promoted or get bonuses because the, that's that's a logic that that logic goes back to i think that that film made in dagenham one of the reasons why women weren't being paid as much as men was because men needed to provide and women didn't and that's why they weren't being paid as much that exists but also you have that whole that culture around actually may, men sometimes you know, they're redoubling their efforts, they're working harder, they might be the sole breadwinner. That comes with a lot of stress for men. They find, you know, there's lots of research that says that men who are sole breadwinners do feel the pressure of that. And so actually having dual income relationships that are thriving is actually good for, good for everyone, good for mental health, good for stress levels, good for gender equality as well. So you can take away some of those assumptions about who does what at home and who does what in the workplace. I've heard about the motherhood penalty but I haven't heard about the fatherhood bonus that's um really interesting yeah so motherhood penalty tell us more about that so the, I think the mother, motherhood penalty comes back to this idea that I guess it's on two levels it's to do with opportunity and income uh, there's a pregnant and screwed estimate that I think it's 54,000 women a year lose their jobs as a result of pregnancy uh, but then and then the, the, the pressure, the struggle to get back into the same type of role and, and those challenges around when men don't take leave, women don't necessarily then get the opportunity to, to um, you know, to return to the workplace because mother knows best, mum's been the one who's been looking after kids. I mean, it happens with any primary carer, so it's not just sort of heterosexual relationships, but the... Um, if men don't learn the skills, it's much harder, and the connections with their children, it's much harder for women to return to the workplace. And we have this whole element around, um, and in which case they take lower, they take jobs that are lower than they were perhaps doing before. So actually, I think, you know, I think plenty of people get, in terms of the gender pay gap, plenty of people get caught up on the fact that actually for the same, it, it's illegal to pay someone a different amount of money for the same role, you know. Um, you can't that that's illegal we we know that's illegal however what what the gender pay gap is more about is understanding why in law firms for instance do you have 52 percent female intake at associate but that flows through to about 20 percent of women at partner level why do where do these women go what is it that's how what is going on structurally within society and within those businesses that means that incredibly talented women do not stay in the business long enough to make partner but the men do and I think you know sometimes you see women who become partners in law firms have to work through a number of hoops and expectations um, that's one particular example that I can know in particular um, but where do where do they go so 
uh, actually that's kind of the that's kind of the sort of the, the key challenge is not that we pay people men and women differently for the same job it's that women drop out of the workplace and that motherhood penalty is related to returning at a lower level um, requiring flexible working because your partner's business won't give men flexible working that's you know part of it you know if you're if you're constrained to pickups and drop-offs because your partner either won't do it or can't do it or doesn't feel able to ask and that's part of the motherhood penalty as well so you kind of build up this this sense um this sense of kind of, of of drag is that we're not we're not helping people to feel fulfill their um you know fulfill their um I guess their desires, but also their, you know, their full opportunity. And it's and it's embedded in culture as well, Polly. It's really, I was really fascinated when I went and did a presentation about why men's work-life balance is a route to gender equality. And I did it with a business that my wife used to work at. And the lady who organized it and got me in, she said, when I first started working with Lisa, I didn't think she had children because I didn't think a mum could do this job. And she said, when I realised that she did, I realised how damaging that was for my prospects as a woman. Regard, I didn't have. She said yeah, I, she doesn't have children. She doesn't have children now. Um, she was in her kind of, uh, I guess, late twenties, early thirties, I would imagine. And she said, "How damaging is it for prospects of all women if I don't believe that a mum can do the type of work that your wife was doing?" Um, and it's a really, and so it's that sense of being embedded in culture. And so, actually. You know, the companies do it really well. They're telling great stories. They're putting men on pedestals in a way that women don't and that we would rather not. But I think it's important to do because it's important to normalise and men look around and go, oh, he's done that. Maybe I can do that too. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's about um, attaching associations to things as well, isn't it? Um, the example you were just giving about the, the lady who said that, um, you know, she didn't think a mum could do this job. I think it's the, the associations that we attach to various situations. Um, yeah, really interesting. Thank you. Um, I was going to just go back. You were talking about um, the expectations that men and women have when they return to the workplace after leave and how different it is for men and women. What have you seen in terms of um, men? Yeah, I think for men returning after extended leave, they don't have that confidence as angle at all, in my experience. That doesn't, whereas my experience of talking to women who coach women, I mean, it's usually women who coach women. I mean, it's, co I mean, gen it's generally actually maternity and paternity coaching is quite gendered it doesn't have to be because coaching can be for anyone but it tends to be quite gendered because part of it is about bringing your own experience to the table and it's more about mentoring in some ways than it is coaching but whereas a lot of the pressures around confidence um, and some of those admin challenges men come to that in a slightly different way men are it's about credibility it's about hitting the targets it is about it's about being a great dad without sacrificing the career Whereas I think the, I think for women, it's probably subtly the other way around. It's about how to make the career work around family life. For men, it's like, well, how do I make the, how do I fit the family life into the career? It's that subtle kind of change. And so, and I think men lag a little bit behind some of the practicalities. They worry about things in a different way. It's really, really common for me to work with guys who, um, who aren't as, aware of the transition points so certainly they're talking about their own transition when they're back to work but typically their partner maybe st is still off because of the way that their leave is is structured but what they're not thinking about as early as uh, as women are thinking about their partners are thinking about is the return when both of you are trying to go to work at the same time or be working i mean and that who's going to do the drop off who's going to do the pickup how are we going to organize childcare what do we need to do to make this work and i think men are on the back foot a little bit they're not thinking about those things as much they I, I do a lot of um, a lot of, a big big chunk at the end of the new dads accelerator is all about building a deeper relationship with your partner. It's all about men learning about the second shift, but not so much the second shift, but um, uh, the emotional labour, the mental load that is often borne by women in uh, heterosexual relationships. What's really interesting about that is that 
there's a, there's a growing body of evidence that says that within single gender relationships, because you haven't got that overlay of gender of who does what at home, it's much more equitable and much more practical in terms of how things are done. So you get less challenge. It becomes a challenge when you think about the workplace context because two men in a relationship, neither of them are expected or expected to have caring responsibilities. If they've got kids, then what does that mean for their, their opportunities to be active involved if we don't think dads can be and equally if we're you know for female relationships what do we you know we're assuming that they're both going to want to be take leave you know we're discounting women so we, those assumptions are damaging whatever relationship you're in really so i think it's uh there's there's lots to be done and talking about it is probably the single most important thing and unpicking some of those assumptions as you said polly yeah I think it sounds as if what you and your wife did I mean I from my own experience we you know myself and my husband we didn't have those open conversations about right how this how is this going to work we just didn't really we just sort of you know <laughs> had the children and then off you go we didn't really think about the wider sort of how that was going to work so I guess in a single sex relationship maybe that's sort of similar that they would have to discuss that and how it's all going to work but I don't yeah, you can't you just can't you can't assume using the gender aspect well you're the man therefore you're going to go out to work actually we're both men we both want to go out to work but we both want to be here how do we make this work and you can't just it, I think it's very easy for couples to slip as you say very easy for couples to slip into those traditional roles especially when men don't have extended leave and women do but it's only societal expectations and assumptions it's not you know we don't have to it's crazy. This is what we need to break down, isn't it, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, absolutely. I think, yeah. But that that overlay, and especially for men, and what actually is men and women, it's that, you know, what does being a good, good mother look like? I mean, a lot of it is to do with making sure the kids, you know, the kids are well turned out. Dads don't have the same kind of judgment about um, parenting. Um, fascinating, there was fascinating research, uh, Annika Schaefer, University of Liverpool, and she did her PhD on non-standard relationships. Non-standard is not quite the right word. I've got, I'm sure she writes it much better than that, but different relationships. And one of the things she looked at was solo dads. And she found that solo dads who were parenting on their own and had really good work-life balance and flexible working arrangements were concealing the presence of a female, of a new female partner, so that they didn't lose that, those benefits in inverted commas that they built up as part of their, um, the fact that they were solo, therefore they had to have, the, you know, they were entitled to a needed flexible working. And what she found was that they were just, no, I don't have a female partner, because uh, because society says, oh, oh, well, the woman can do that. You know, and they were concealing it. They knew, they knew that they were going to lose out if they, they were going to lose those benefits if they said, and so they were concealing it. Really fascinating. It was really fascinating when I came across Annika's work. That's really interesting. Thank you. So do you think the uh, pandemic has been a catalyst for change in this area? And what have you seen? I think it's a real mixed bag. I think there's lots of evidence that women have dropped out of the workplace in greater numbers than, than men have. Certainly in dual income sort of office-based environments uh, office, you know, where, where, where homeschooling came into the factor and just looking up when, when the support of school or childcare provision had kind of moved out of the way, then I think the pressure often fell on women. But what we found was that there's lots of evidence that men did a lot more domestic labor than they'd previously done. Where they'd been physically out of the house, maybe five days a week, they were now exposed to um, a lot more of the pressures and they understood a lot more about what went on to ena almost enable their kind of working lives. And although it's been really tough, men, have, men consistently uh, show that they want more of it they want to be more connected they want to be more involved and I think the longer we go on as we we're approaching kind of we're, we're approaching two years now of pandemic I really don't think we're going to go back to anywhere near the working patterns that people would have assumed where the default was five days a week I think men are increasingly and society more generally are becoming increasingly comfortable with the hybrid model which is great for you know it's great for individuals it's great for choice really you know not everyone wants to work from home all the time uh, most people don't want to work from home all the time and they don't want to work from the office all the time they want a blend of both and if you can help them to construct working lives that support their other pressures and men are increasingly 
showing that that's what they want, then I think you'll find that people will be happier, they'll be more loyal, and the best companies will hoover up the talent. Companies who pay attention to what everyone wants and ask questions, especially if dads, what do you need? What working pattern do you need? Um, I see lots of examples of the businesses who are just like, well, work's getting done, we'll connect up, we don't need to be in the office all the time, the whole, you know, everything's changed and it works and we can, and people are happy and, you know, some of those pressures that maybe dads were feeling a couple of years ago, where it's like, well, how on earth can I do this? And no one's going to take me seriously if I want to work from home one, one day a week. And now we're talking about, wow, three days a week in the office seems like a, seems like a, a massive imposition. So men are, I, I think men are voting with their feet. The evidence seems to suggest that men have got the confidence now. And the longer we go through kind of COVID inspired or enforced um, change in working patterns, then I think the longer, the harder it will be, despite the uh, efforts of real estate and perhaps government and some of the American banks, but who have their own particular cultural um, challenges, uh, I don't think we'll be turning back the clock anytime soon. Yeah, really interesting. I agree with you. Um, great. So um, if there are organisations out there thinking, right, I need to do, I'd like to do more in this area, what practical tips would you give them to um, increase, you know, support for dads around your own working? Yeah, I think I think being aware of what your what your support is for new dads in particular. I think that transition around new dads is the real the really key element. Is that not just assuming that men will cope because they're men, um, and that treating the support, whether that's support in terms of community groups, whether it's support in terms of workshops. So sometimes I do yeah, I do workshops in terms of looking at practical steps that men can do to get their you know to support their work life balance and look at the different aspects of our flexible working and understanding and doing exercises around you know how how good is your work-life balance are you happy is your partner happy is it the other way around is everyone is everyone happy now how does that that kind of work i think there's some really interesting trends in terms of um employee resource groups so whether they're parenting or mums so traditionally they've been mums um kind of parenting resource groups they're starting to kind of become parenting rather than the mum focus but there's actually something around perversely there's something around focusing on dads as a separate entity because men in parenting groups may not are not going to be communicating about their pressures in quite the same way that men do when they're in men only groups and there is something quite powerful i think in terms of supporting the family transition is to look at women as one well in, in, as a group and men as a group and it's also powerful to look at parents as to, to do a mixture of those sort of things. Um, so I, I and, and often with, with businesses, what's really popular, what I'm finding really popular, and I did quite a lot around International Men's Day a couple of weeks ago, is to do a presentation where I walk businesses through why, a folk, why supporting new dads is a route to gender equality. And we talk about the fears, we talk about the pressures and shine a light on the type of things that you can do and why you need to change the dynamics in the workplace and telling stories of relationship breakdown because men don't spend enough time thinking about their uh, their work-life balance and how that impacts on their relationships at home and so when things aren't working at home it's very hard to bring your full self to the office and to, the, to the workplace or or to the uh, or to the spare room wherever that may be and I think for businesses it's about it's about understanding paying a bit more attention to dads, especially new dads, and actually saying, this is really, this is a really important transition. It's really stressful. NCT have, you know, NCT data suggests that 10% of new dads, um, uh, I, don't know, it's, I, mean, look, I think it's 10% of new dads um, suffer depression in the first year of becoming a parent. And the, uh, and it's twice as likely, you know, it's twice as likely to um, affect new dads as it is the rest of the population. There's some quite striking kind of postnatal depressions for um, standards. So have a look at, have a think about, for businesses, it's to have a think about what support mechanisms are there around new dads? Where are, where can men talk about the pressures of trying to be Massive transition. So I think you suddenly become a dad sometimes. Um, for me, certainly, 
Whereas Lisa talked about, you know, she was becoming a mum while she was carrying the baby. For me, it's like, oh, hi, Freya, baby. Hi, I'm now a dad. It's very much, and it's, it hits you in a very different way. I don't really remember Strun, so Strun. Um, I remember with Freya, I vividly remember holding Freya. I don't remember holding Strun in quite the same way. Um, I think maybe that, but it's, it's to do with that first time nature. I think if you can, yeah, you focus around the first time dads, new, um, new dads, that transition, and you support men to understand what they need and what they need as a relationship and make them feel like it's okay to be a dad. I think that's first and foremost, you know, part of it and to talk about being a dad. And, you know, it's, it's something we don't talk about enough. I think it's becoming more and more common. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, just going back, we were just talking about, um, you know, the, the changes that the pandemic maybe has um, created. And it seems to me that the legal position in terms of flexible working is really quite, um, you know, it's not really fitting for what's going on in reality at the moment now. Um, and I think there, you know, there may be changes afoot in terms of the legislation. So at the moment, employees who have um, 26 weeks service can request, um, they have the right to request flexible working. Um, I just wondered if, I don't know, I'm putting you on the spot now, but I wondered if there'd been an increase in re flexible working requests um, since the pandemic or your thoughts on that? Um, I Well, the, the legal structure, as you say, is a little bit convoluted. Yeah, yeah like you say, it's 20, if you've been at a business for 26 weeks uh, and then you can ask and they've got three months to say yes or no. Now, for most for, for, for most families, that just doesn't fly. It just doesn't work. If, it, if it's day one flexible working, it's advertised as such. Um, if you've got responsive, caring responsibilities, you need flexible work from the start and you just won't seek out jobs that don't look like that. I suspect we haven't seen an increase in flexible working uh, arrangements because, or the request because if you're, in a, if you're in an industry which supports remote working, you haven't been in the office, you're already almost by, it's almost on the side, we've become flexible. And we, and the expectations around blending work and home life have massively changed. And so we can't just kind of ignore it. Actually, it's almost like a moot point. Yeah, you could put in a flexible working request, but I'm already, we're already doing it. And what, what are you going to do? Turn me down? That's ridiculous. Kind of and so I think there's an interesting it's an interesting stat from last last year. So there was a year year block where it was. I think the number of men taking parental leave was down about seventeen percent. Now I think that's interesting because I've I've um, in one of my new dad's accelerators there were men who weren't that bothered about parental leave particularly because they were already in the home. They were already actively there. They were already working flexibly. So like, well, I don't really need to formally take my leave per se because I'm already, we're, we're flex, we've moved into a different kind of narrative around flex. Um, it has accelerated that and facilitated that, I guess, because people, you know, you might be in your spare room working away, but you can spend your lunch hour with your child and your family or whatever it is. I think there's an element of that. I still think men should take their leave and ring my, and, and ring fence it and all the rest of it because I think it's an important it's important to do that as a as an entity. But there's certainly men that I've talked to kind of feel that actually maybe we don't need to. And so I don't know about I don't know about the stats about um, formalized flexible working. What I do know is that going back a couple of years, I did a workshop at Exxon Mobil down in Southampton Forley Refinery and did a couple of workshops. And the, all, every single man, I think in the first workshop, every single man was working flexibly on an informal basis. It was just, and now it's, and part of that is it's a challenge because informal flexible working does not work if you've got caring responsibilities. You know, I don't work informally flexibly. At three o'clock, I don't work. You know, I don't work after three o'clock. Um, I did last, I did, uh, I did uh, earlier this week, actually. Um, but that was because it was East Coast, uh, East Coast New York for Ralph Lauren. That was the only time you could do it. <laughs> but if you, but men, men have always worked flexibly. They just haven't talked about it and they haven't formalized it. So it's always gone under the radar. And I think, I think the societal shift from the pandemic will be such that, you know, businesses who expect, you know, men, people will be asking, men and women will be asking, what's your policy on working in the office? Well, uh, we expect everyone to be in four days a week. Okay, well, I'll go to this company who, who say that we're going in, you know, we're going in every once a week. 
twice a week because that's our collaboration day. And the businesses who don't adapt, I think, will find it harder and harder to recruit and, and retain ultimately. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you. Um, we're coming towards the end of our time. I just wondered if you had any last thoughts about anything really about, um, yeah, about anything that we've discussed. Yeah, I think, I think the number one thing for, for businesses is that to have conversations with dads about how they're organising their childcare in a way that we don't, on a legal basis, people have shied away from asking mums and women about their plans for children. But actually, I think there's something really powerful about asking men about their plans and making them think about, well, how are you going to do this? Um, and it's kind of, and it's a strange one because actually, it's not, I, I suspect it's not legal to ask, is it? I'm not entirely sure. Probably you'll probably know better than I do. But we've moved away from that anyway, culturally. But I think there's something powerful in asking men and making men think about what arrangements they do. And if and if it's to do with returning to a physical workplace, and, and certainly next summer, we are, hopefully we'll be normal-ish again, who knows? Um, you know, just assume, If you assume that men don't have caring responsibilities, you are by necessity implying that women are the ones who have the caring responsibilities. And so as a business, if you want to support your, you know, your workforce, then having human conversations, line managers, working at what support people need and helping them design a hybrid model that works for the business and works for the individual, I think is really, really important. And for men, I guess my parting thing was look up uh, the concept of mental load, understand what it is that emotionally, the organisational processes and the, and the mental process, not just a list, it's all very well having a list of, yes, uh, ticking off, taking the bins out, doing the gardening, whatever it might be. Who's thinking about the Christmas cards? Who's making sure the presents have been bought for Christmas? Um, those kind of things. Um, it generally feel, falls, in most relationships, it falls upon um, women and it is a drag for dual income couples because it is harder to progress when you've got all this emotional, mental baggage, this mental load that is uh, taking place. So men should always understand mental load. It's the thing, it's the, yeah, it's a part of the New Dads Accelerator at the end, where that's the fifth module we talk about that. And it's the thing that really sticks in the mind. Men just don't really, haven't considered, don't, aren't aware of the challenge. They're kind of, yeah, I'm a great dad. I do exactly what I'm told at home. It's like, no, it needs to be more than that. You need to be owning it. Um, so yeah, that's what men should do. Look up mental load. Good luck, men. Thank you. And if people would like to get in touch with you and carry on talking about this and how you can help, how might people get in touch? Yeah, so the website is inspiringdads.co.uk. Um, all the link, lots of links there, lots of blog posts, lots of content uh, there. And also on LinkedIn, I'm one of only two Ian Dinwiddies in the country. One of them is an engineering manager from Jacobs. Uh, in Shropshire, I believe, uh, in Telford, I think he lives, he plays squash, but that's not, um, that's not me, um, but yeah, connect on me on LinkedIn and send me a, send me a DM and, uh, and, you know, have the conversations through there, I do a lot of, a lot of uh, um, posting on LinkedIn, so yeah, look up Ian Didwoody and you'll find Ian, founder of Inspiring Dads on LinkedIn. Brilliant. Thank you so much. The various different research and reports that you've mentioned sound fascinating and we'll, um, we'll provide links in the notes that accompany the episode. But Ian, thank you so much. I knew this would be a really fab conversation and I really appreciate your time. <laughs> well, thank you, Polly. It's been great to talk about it. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an important conversation um, that individuals, families, businesses should be having about how you know how we support dads and and what that means for gender equality and for um for broader societal change that we would quite like to see i think so thank you for inviting me on brilliant thank you so much